Yeah. What's up? What is los? Good. This is better. It's an actual physical conference in Europe. You are privileged. I am privileged. Thank you so much to come and see my amazing face and listening to these great people. It is really an incredible opportunity to be here. I mean, this conference is the only one that got a permit to actual hosting a physical conference. I mean, it's a mind-blowing thing. I know it's sometimes it can be quite downer to listen to some talks and be on your phone, but for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to challenge you for something that is quite crazy for teenagers, maybe for you too, not be on the phone. Let's try it. So without further ado, I will introduce you uh, the next speaker on stage, who's going to give us an incredible snapshot into one of the biggest corporations in the world, one of the most influential also in Germany, founded over 100 years ago. But today, a young and handsome man called Oliver Hoffman is going to go and tell us about Audi. Oliver, wherever you are, left or right, please come on stage and give us a big hand. Welcoming Oliver. Come on, you can do better. You can do better. That one over there. Yeah, nice. So hello, hello everybody, and uh, not so easy to speak after this guy, but uh, first of all, he made my day. He said, oh, you're looking better than the video conference yesterday, so everything is fine here. Again, hello and thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. For me, the Green Tech Festival is an inspiring platform for all who change the world for better. And our contribu contribution as Audi is e-mobility. Audi is driving its transformation as a provider of sustainable premium mobility. We are already and clearly committed to the Paris Agreement and we want to achieve carbon neutrality to the long term. Electric mobility will come at differing speeds globally, depending on infrastructure, local policies, and the supply of CO2-free primary energy. The Green Deal makes Europe the pioneer of BEV transformation, and we, as Audi, want to play a leading role in it. For that reason, we will continuously expand our BEV portfolio. We started with the e-tron family in 2019 with the Audi e-tron. This year, we launched the Audi e-tron GT and the Q4 e-tron. The brand plans to ramp up its efforts by 2025 with a very wide range of electric cars, up to 20 fully, fully electric cars. And Speaking of electric mobility, today, range, anxiety, and lack of charging infrastructure are one of the top reasons not to buy an electric car. That's why the whole VW group will increase the number of fast charging points of Europe fivefold over the next four years. In addition, we at Audi offer own premium charging solutions to cover premium use cases and peak demand. The Audi charging hub consists of flexible container cubes with a charging output, output of more than 300 kilowatt. The batteries inside the cubes are second life batteries from Audi electric cars. A pilot project in the second half of the year will provide a specific outlook and a practical test for a possible serial rollout. Our vision as Audi is absolutely clear. We want to, be, we want to become a provider of carbon neutral mobility with electric vehicles and renewable energy sources for charging. That's why we are also partnering with energy providers. The aim is to build new wind and solar farms in various European countries by 2025. The Audi-founded projects are expected to feed an additional 5 terawatt 
five terawatt hours uh, energy and uh, sorry sorry The first project is a solar park in Germany with RVE and we are starting next year. The plant is designed for a total capacity of 170 million kilowatt hours with 420,000 solar panels. This corresponds to an installed capacity of about 250 new wind turbines. Our goal is to feed the same amount of green power into the grid that all the electric Audi cars on the road need to drive on average. The expansion of renewable energy sources at an industrial scale is the next step towards carbon neutral mobility. And over the long term, we plan to expand to other regions, including outside Europe. This is the way to our clear vision to be a provider of sustainable premium mobility. Electric mobility, sustainable energy and sustainable, sustainability driven companies are all symptoms of a profound change of global values. And all the participants of the Green Tech Festival have been dealing with this transformation for years. A new sustainable company mindset has a deep impact not only on our project and on our customers, but from my point of view, also on the company itself and above all on our employees. We have to take them to the new sustainable world, all of them, with new skills, with new company culture, and last but not least, with a new mindset. And I guess this is the most crucial topic of this change, also of our panel. Thanks a lot for inviting me and to listen. Thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Thank you. Have a seat in the middle. And Which one? I have to yeah, choose. Yeah, I think they're all kind of same. Maybe that's made by Audi or... I don't know. This, this yeah, is why not? Audi, yeah. And uh, I would like to welcome on stage Sebastian. Sebastian. An explorer and good at hide and seek. Hey, there is. Give it a big hand. You can do a little bit better. Come on, German people. Come on. Yeah. Go on, go on, go on. Boom. Have a seat. Thank you. Someone did even a whoo. This was really great. All right. So we have uh, two humans in physical form here, which is great. We have, I think, two others in digital form, which I don't see. Oh, there they are. Hey, good. Asher on the left side. Asher, hi. Do we hear them? Okay. And on the other side, Christian, hi. Hello to Berlin. Hey, all right, cool. Asher, why are you not here? Oh, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? You were supposed um, to be right here. What happened? That I know, because there was awful talking about technology, just real bad delays and technical glitches in getting a Delta flight out from the United States over to Berlin. So mobility so betrayed really you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have everyone here. Um, thank you so much for taking that the opening keynote. It's not easy after a long period of uh, not having events to actually speak to cameras and the people. So I appreciate everyone's time here. We haven't heard about you. Who are you and why are you here? Well, I'm a, I'm a polar explorer. Um, I've spent, um, you know, decades uh, traveling the polar regions and, um, and uh, looking at and studying the impacts of climate change on, on ice. And um, since then, I've, I've founded a, a think tank and a foundation that studies uh, the confluence of various systems and uh, look at what the state of the world is from the wheel of climate change. So it affects socioeconomics, uh, technology, geopolitics, etc. cetera. Um, and so my work is divided between uh, studying at-risk environments and uh, try to look in a crystal ball and look at all these elements and predict the future. You, you said something interesting when we had a chat before that climate change doesn't have a passport. Right. What, what does that mean? I mean, obviously, we know what it means, but does it mean that 
it impacts Russia as equally as Netherlands? I mean, well, that's that's a great question. In fact, it's interesting. In this COVID time, we've really come to realize what a global challenge is. That if you solve an issue somewhere, it doesn't mean that it's resolved for you globally. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, needless to say, the pandemic is an easy, um, tangible way to understand it. But climate is exactly the same thing. Uh, whether it is uh, the disparity of hydrology in certain environments uh, that impacts the global calories and therefore the movement of people and, um, and in that respect, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who seek a better, uh, more prosperous um, uh, life and so migrate to other places that destabilizes sociopolitical environments. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of uh, rising sea levels and that is also without passport. It doesn't matter whether you're in Bangladesh or in Florida, uh, you know, whether you're in China or in the Netherlands, you still have the same global problem. Asher, uh, I know you personally, but people don't know you here. So tell us who you are and, and, and what excites you about what you do. Sure. Um, I w I w I'm a National Geographic Explorer, and I've always looked at the nexus between uh, commercial ventures, corporate social responsibility, uh, sustainable development, and conservation initiatives on the ground, which is why I felt called to technology being the final frontier of exploration uh, for a couple of reasons. One, efficiency, which is to say that it is the quickest, smartest, most effective way to deliver solutions on the ground. It takes away choice, which we've conflated with freedom. And uh, nature doesn't give choice. It is specific in its outcomes, and it engineers everything to optimally deliver its services and capacities to the whole, uh, which is what technology does. And the tertiary reason why I am now a technological explorer is because we are looking to have um, outcomes that allow for users to be channeled through very specific conduits towards realizing these solutions. Because if you just give them the opportunity to participate without knowing how, then they can't be enabled to act. And so I'm incredibly passionate about user experience and ensuring that we use products effectively to help them deliver as only each citizen can when they're mobilized towards actions. Uh, Oliver, I know this kind of might sound, I mean, for me, I mean, I know Asher, but for you as a corporate leader, does this sound like wishy-washy, like something that you, people who are, who are like Asher, who explore the world, are, are, are thinking of a world that might not exist from your angle? Like, what does it sound like? Do you think that Audi can help someone like Asher and Sebastian? I think so, I think so. And it, it, it sounds for me, it's, it sounds the right way, and, and we need this push yeah, to push us as an industry um, to make this transformation very fast. You know, this is the biggest transformation ever in the, in the automotive industry, yeah? and, and we, we need to push, and, and we need also to push from, 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 from our circumstances, from, from, from the people around us, yeah? and I'm, I'm really happy to, to, to drive this transformation on the technology side and, and technological side and also on the cultural side and on the mindset side. So it's, it sounds good for me. And, and for me, as a, I'm the board member of Audi, so we have a big company, 90,000 um, employees, and we have to take care of them. And we have to, to take them with us for this transformation. There must it, it sounds good, and we I'm need this push. I'm sure this, it sounds good, but there must be some resistance because Audi is a, is a centenarian company. It's, yeah. it's old school. Uh, I know you guys are pushing for electricity. We'll come to that uh, later, but I want to have that. I want to plant the seed in your mind. There's another corporation, a big one. Christian, um, would you introduce quickly who you are and why? Uh, what excites you about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Hello from Baden-Baden to Berlin. Well, I'm a business engineer working for SAP uh, with also a blue color career before my studies. And of course, with that, I carry technology and in my DNA. I had to, within the last 23 years at SAP the pleasure to work with plenty of our global customers, combining technology with digitalization and then to solve problems with digitalization. In my current role, uh, I'm responsible for the new venture technologies looking in sustainability engagements 
and my teams are working gladly um, in a holistic approach with um, academia, with government, with research institutes, with co-innovation customers, but also with the ecosystem, with partners and, and uh, startups. And that provides us uh, the, the kind of possibility to really look holistically, understanding the problem yeah and then get into digital solutions to to fix problems and of course that includes topics like carbon tracking green hydrogen circular manufacturing where um, for the first few you would think okay what the, what it has this to do with uh, sap but if you look closer uh, digital um, solutions digital technology can be um, the kind of lever the salt and pepper to really uh, be part of solving these topics and uh, that's why i'm very happy to be part of this panel uh, be part of the green tech festival because uh, i see the green tech festival as an inspiring platform to really meet with like-minded people and exchange and build coalition for success and that's for me all that about uh, sustainability is a broad topic we need to build coalitions work in a network to really tackle the big problems sebastian you're explorer you're, you're uh, i i have how many countries have you seen in your life how many places you've visited how many nations well, I, I've lost count. I mean, you know, my, my area of predilection is at the ice, so I, I'm, I'm more about an at-risk environment. I've studied deserts a little bit as well, but, uh, uh, but I, I want to riff for one second on what Ollie uh, said earlier, because this is, a, th this is the most innovative, transformational and systemic changes it, that we're seeing since um, basically the use of coal as a, as a source of energy um, almost 200 years ago. And, uh, you know, the, the, what's really most exciting about it is that in, in, instead of a combustion engine vehicle, and particularly an e-mobility, which I think is a low-hanging fruit for, uh, for just regular people and customers, this is something that you can really activate and have within your power to change. But the, the level of innovation that's going on there yeah. is, is no longer just about one company Internally, it's about outsourcing new developments that are, you know, startup driven and finding ways where people are really creating new ideas. And I think this is where Audi is actually a market leader in this, is in opening its door to, to, uh, to startups and to new ideas and to vertically integrate them within its platform, but to basically laterally um, export them within, within society. And, and I think that, you know, we've not seen a technologically more exciting time than this since perhaps the airplane. Asher, I'm a skeptical about corporates. When you hear something like SAP and Audi telling you these things, do you believe them? Do you want to challenge them? Well, here's the thing. I am currently uh, with my own company, Hive and Hamlet, Inc. What we're focusing on is blockchain technology, which affords us that decentralized, distributed system of accountability and transparency. And uh, although there's a lot of apprehension and misinformation about NFTs and their iteration in the world, I think, once again, that's another conduit through which we can deliver impact systems. So I think there are collaborations possible. And I do believe that corporations like Audi, BMW and other brands that you guys host at Green Tech Festival, uh, including SAP, have the capacity to truly be pioneers of change, which they are showing up as at present. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons why I work so closely with brands, whether I worked with Prada, Adidas, any of the companies that I've collaborated or partnered with has been because they are the real um, conduit for mass change globally. It's not about just one place, one action being taken. It's, uh, it's something that has to be decentralized and empowered from the toe up everywhere in the world simultaneously. And that synchronicity is what's going to really allow for a paradigm shift occur uh, systematically and in a manner where we really see it's not just talk, but that is walking that path too. Additionally, I think, you know, uh, there's this thing that has existed for all these years, which is that if a company has been around for 100 years, it's more validated in its existence, it's brand-based trust. But what blockchain technology can do is allow for math-based trust. You can show up in this moment, in the present tense, and still be able to make a, a, a commitment and deliver on that. Um, and I think that brands like Audi can leverage that mechanism now to to deliver um, their messaging and their uh, impacts in real time to their audience as well as on the ground. Um, so I do think technology is an extremely democratic way to allow for top-down and bottom-up engagement. Um, and, that's and that's why I don't think it's you know, hogwash for us to be sitting here in a panel
panel talking about these topics because this is where we're going to see the most important changes of our time, which need to occur and should have occurred yesterday. So we're already a day late in everything we're committing to. Um, so I'm really glad for many of the perspectives Sebastian's expressed because, yes, it is incredibly urgent and we should be doing everything. It's no longer an afterthought, um, as Oliver was saying. Um, sustainability is a commitment that we have had to make yesterday and therefore today is a day late but we are doing everything we can and that's really how we should be approaching this um so yeah and i really believe in 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 tech being a way for every single person in the world to be mobilized towards being that uh change maker that conduit for true transformation uh, oliver uh, i'm th- uh, what asher is saying there's a lot of change happening obviously we're seeing the change but i'm sure some people at your company are afraid of for their jobs uh, for, for, for the innovation. I mean, it's fast. Like Sebastian said, we're moving so fast right now. And, and traditional people who work in car manufacturing and other jobs, are they afraid? How do you, how do you, how do you take, make them less afraid of the change? Yeah. So this is, is a very, very important point for us. It's, it's not, uh, not only the biggest transformation in, in terms of technology from ICE to BEV, it's, it's, it's a culture change and it's a, it's a mindset change. And um, we have a, a holistic approach uh, for this transformation. And, this, and, and, and a lot of people are afraid of this change because they, they loved it to work for Audi, they, they loved it to, to, to build ICE engines, and now we are, we are changing a lot. And um, this is the reason why we also focus on, on mindset and, and culture and to give them um, the freedom to say, okay, look, you will also have your job in the next years, but not, not the same job than before. We have to change a lot, but we will go with you. We will go with all employees in the, in the new world. And um, if you, I, I, I saw in the last years, if, if you are very clear with your, with your, with your goals, with your strategy and... Uh, you have the, the good story, a right story to be to be uh, successful also in the in the future. The the, the employees they believe in, in your in your way and the, your strategy, and uh, this is very important to be successful as a as a company also in this transformation transformation phase. And and uh, we are f- we are pushing and we have a clear focus on culture and mindset in the in the whole company. Yeah, 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 go ahead. You know, if I can jump in, you know, there's also one major change uh, because the, the, this internal uh, cultural fear to, uh, to innovate beyond the sort of the knowledge base of, of the top engineer. Uh, and I've spoken with a variety of different CEOs at BMW as well, where, you know, top down direction doesn't necessarily trickle all the way down to the engineer yeah. floor. Even if you try to, people are fearful of their jobs, so they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. But I think two things have changed that. First of all, a clear target, which is um, the, you know, the, the carbon neutrality goals that have been set by various countries. In Germany, it's quite aggressive. It was 55% uh, carbon neutrality by 2035, which has just been up by another 10% by the, just, the, the, the Justice Department. So now we're at 65% carbon neutrality in 14 years. This is a very, very sharp target, which basically forces people to get out of their comfort zone. And I think the secondary aspect, which is true for Audi as it is for other companies, is to open their door to innovation that's coming from the outside, as I was mentioned earlier. So that you're, you know, once again, vertically integrated, but laterally distributed. Christian, as a software company, uh, how, do you, how do you notice the change you guys are making? Uh, I'm a bit confused about what, what SAP can do as a software company uh, versus what a, a, a physical uh, product company like Audi can do. Yeah, fair question. Um, but uh, at the end, it's a lot. Um, uh, we can, of course, um, act as a sampler yeah? uh, ourselves, uh, become a zero emission uh, company. That's where we're on the way to. But the more important uh, topic uh, to act as an enabler, I mean, uh, with our 400,000 customers and, and um, almost 75% of global world business data covering an SAP system, of course, if we help our customers to get transparency on their carbon emissions, on their processes that run 
on SAP solutions already across the supply chain, if we get that transparent and help them to reduce the emission, the lever that we have um, is, is enormous yeah? um, um, to, to kind of uh, change uh, and be part of the climate change. And next step is then to help also customers uh, with uh, business networks, uh, getting connected alongside the network, exchanging data yeah, in an anonymous way, maybe um, um, building um, business cases cross-company based on data and then uh, doing cross-company simulations. So um, it's all based on data, it's based on trust, and all that uh, is powered by um, um, big, bigger solutions. And to jam in on the kind of uh, people, um, well, I um, strongly believe what um, Oliver mentioned uh, before, that uh, we have to give the people the, the uh, right right story yeah, and uh, take them on board. Yeah? The advantage that we have with sustainability as a topic, that more or less everyone wants to be part of uh, making the world run better. Yeah? So that's the ad advantage. And we, if we embed and uh, activate the passion of our employees in that, that is an uh, enormous lever uh, again. And uh, in that, uh, we, we also work on solutions in terms of uh, kind of uh, converting a kind of uh, digital twin. Um, once uh, companies know um, more than payroll and uh, more than administrative data about their employees, uh, if they know what uh, is motivating them, if they know what uh, is, is uh, them driving them day by day, then you can uh, act and, and uh, give them a kind of uh, personal uh, rec recommendation to be really part of uh, specific projects and part of the um, uh, part of the um, kind of um, driver. And one additional comment to what Ash said uh, in regards of the um, startup uh, versus or in combination with corporates. That's again a good um, kind of combination from my point of view. Corporate and uh, startup is a good combination to really uh, tackle um, the, the big problems. I call it one plus one gets uh, three to really solve the big uh, problems. If we combine the, the corporate power and, and the scalability of an Audi and BMW of an SAP with the speed and, and the kind of passion and the can-do mentality of startups, I think that's um, enormous. And at the end, uh, it's um, all about digital digital solutions to then uh, connect uh, startup solutions with uh, our solutions and make them available for our customers. Uh, Asher, uh, quick note. Are you, as, uh, um, are you excited or are you bored of what's happening right now in terms of what corporates are doing for climate change? Because there's so much they're using, they're using so much marketing, they're so much, they're pushing. Are they greenwashing in your opinion in general or are they actually doing things? I think it's what Sebastian was saying uh, about, you know, whether the top down approach is actually feasible when it comes to relaying information down to the engineers. It's the same thing when it comes to commitments. Um, when they're bearing in mind the old premise of stakeholder, shareholder capitalism, and now it's shifting more towards stakeholder capitalism, um, there is going to be some time needed uh, to catch up between the old and the new. And I think for a long while, we've done business as usual and tried to make Make commitments that will fit keeping that old framework in place. What we need is to go through that discomfort of uprooting what we've known and moving into that which is um, going to be a much a uh, greater, uh, far more accelerated pace at which we need to be delivering solutions on the ground instead of pontificating commitments that we can't keep for the next 10 years, the next 15 years, 20 years. And people tend to do that. A lot of brands do say, oh, by 2050, we'll change. We don't have until 2050. We should be acting now. And so given that need for presence, I do love what Christian mentioned about collaboration and especially between uh, larger entities that are very heavy in the in the level of staffing and the fact that they cannot operate in this lean, mean, green efficiency mode that we need at this juncture, uh, partnering up with startups that operate in that way will help us come towards um, synergistic outcomes that might otherwise not be possible. So I do think it's, it's time for us to set our egos aside and work together as opposed to thinking that one person can be sort of the savior or hero of the day. Um, having said that, I, I would also add that like, you know, in terms of transparency, accountability, when you've been established as a brand, you want to stick to that identity. Um, but we are asking for greater authenticity than sort of a portrayed uh, brand positioning that has been uh, curated into play, into play, right? And I think now people are expecting something that's far more raw, real, and representative of the times we live in. And that's another shift that needs to happen. So even in how we're showing up, it's not the state, static, stagnant, 
dominant version of an identity rather an identity that's willing to be adaptive, present, and very much emulative of natural systems and a natural way of being. Uh, so if we we're really looking at biomimicry across the board, not just in terms of you know how we uh, inspire engineering um, solutions out of it, uh, and look at it in terms of whether you know whether it's design processes, systems thinking, all of it needs to emulate nature and be cyclical, cradle to cradle, and and iterative, which means you know that we're constantly improving every step of the way, every single day. It's not one and done. Rather, it is a continuous process of co-creation and co-evolution, and that's really the 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 environment that is going to foster solutions that will be very in sync with the whole, which is of course nature at large. Um, and we're a part of that. We're not apart from that. So I think you know we really do have to shift out of a lot of things, a lot of bad habits and patterns of being that we've been stuck in for the longest while that um, we've taken for granted that, you know, the world will just stick around no matter what, but it is a finite, fragile planet and we are running out of time and we're, we, we cannot make excuses anymore. Literally, we're running out of time. Uh, we already did, but just a quick point, Sebastian, you have one of the most powerful people in auto industry right next to you. He's working hard on, 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 on climate change. Is there something that you want more from him? You can hold him accountable in a public place right now. What can you say? What do you want? Well, I think the, the, uh, the, uh, the paradigm shift is, uh, uh, hinges on, on, on behavior and attitudes and, and how do you dispel attitudes internally within, uh, within a company and how does this also spell out into society. So I'm going to put a call out right now. There's a, there's a movement to sort of shift away from the vernacular or the terminology of sustainability and to start to think more in terms of regeneration. And this is, um, I think for me, you know, the notion of carbon neutrality is, uh, is already 10 years past. Um, we need to start to move forward in terms of the way that we think of balancing this ecosystem. And uh, in, in that sense, I believe that uh, companies, uh, you know, whether it be Audi or, or other multinational, need to think of not just neutralizing your carbon output, but actually positively impacting uh, the, you know, the, the, the release of, of oxygen and the regeneration of natural ecosystems. How does that sound like as a closing words for this panel? How does that sound? Is it too much as a wishy-washy? No, or? no, no. We, we had a, an expiring discussion before and um, I'm really committed to push this transformation as hard as I can. And we as Audi, we are fully committed. You can do that. You can do a little bit more. That was a pretty good statement. And it's on video, by the way. <laughs> it's on video. <laughs> I am so sorry that I have to uh, crush well, the That's party. it. That's so much. Thank you so much for it, guys. <laughs> Thanks, everyone in Digitally. Thanks for here. Thank you, Sean. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.